Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to Utility Sports. And as you can see here from the video today, we are back into NFL Mock Draft season with the return of Mock Draft Mondays. If you guys are new to the channel, make sure to hit that like button on today's video and also subscribe because we are going to be doing this all year long leading up to the 2022 NFL Draft. A lot of you probably know us from last year. We're really excited to be bringing you a brand new draft class this year with a lot of new names, faces, and also some returning ones, which makes it a really fun process for us. So, Austin, let's go ahead and jump in here to the first overall pick. It is the Houston Texans here. This order is a projection from a, a variety of websites uh, and kind of a collective order here on what we kind of think is going to play out. Some of these we don't necessarily agree with, uh, but it is based off of some other orders, Austin. And at one, the Houston Texans amid the Deshaun Watson drama – you have them going with quarterback Spencer Rattler from the University of Oklahoma. Break down this selection. Why is Rattler pick number one at this point? Spencer Rattler is here solely because of his physical traits. He has a lively arm. He can scramble, a dynamic playmaker. However, he can be erratic at times. We saw that with this past game against Tulane where they ended up almost losing because of his kind of carelessness with the ball. Ended up throwing two interceptions in that game. I watched that. Um, there were some times where he really flashed and showed that, that true number one potential. And then there's other times where it really makes you scratch your head. So I'm not sure that by the end of the year, he is still the number one overall pick. But as it sits right now, the Houston Texans would be looking for a dynamic playmaker. And that's really who Spencer Rattler is. Right. With this, you're obviously making the assumption that Deshaun Watson is going to be traded at some point. And I also have another question here for you, Austin, that I think a lot of viewers are probably curious about with Spencer Rattler. This isn't a Trevor Lawrence situation, right? He's not the clear guy throughout this whole process. No, this, this very well could change throughout the course of the year. This is not one of those perfect quarterback prospects. I use that in quotes, but he, he's a guy that could shift down. You could see him still in that top 10, but the later part of the top 10, you could see him you know, fall out of the top 10 completely. I think that is a possibility. depends on really how he plays. This is not the true no matter what happens, number one overall pick kind of deal. Like if he gets hurt, there very well could be shifts in the draft where, you know, he maybe he's in the later part of the first round, depending on what happens health-wise. So to answer your question, no, he's not that Trevor Lawrence kind of situation. Right, which is exactly why you guys need to be subscribed here to keep up with this series as we go, because Spencer Rattler right now as number one could end up being possibly number eight, number 12. We don't quite know yet. Austin does so much homework, so much research, so much watching games that this is the place that you need to be to keep up with the entire NFL draft. Moving into pick two now, the Detroit Lions are slated to be the second overall pick based off of those rankings we talked about earlier, Austin. And again, another quarterback goes off the board, Sam Howell from North Carolina, threw three interceptions in week one of the college football season. Why does he still stay in the top two for you? And I think this is, you know, I didn't want to overreact, overreact to week number one. I think that's what happens with a lot of people. I've seen Sam Howell being dropped way out of the, out of the top 10, even because of that first performance. I just don't think that is correct. Sam Howell was, you know, the projected possible number one overall pick. And there's been some steam on him or Spencer Rattler, but that game against Virginia Tech, he did not look particularly well. The North Carolina team in general just was out of sorts. They were really having issues against that Virginia Tech defense, which is severely underrated to this day. But I think he's going to bounce back. I think he still you know, can play to that number two overall pick. He's got a little ways to go. He's got a nice quick release, um, accurate quarterback. Not the best physical traits, but he is a quality starting quarterback in the league. Right, that's how I feel about it too. And Detroit is one of those interesting teams this year because the receiver play is going to be very subpar. Uh, you and I have talked about this a lot off the channel, Austin. Talk about Jared Goff a little bit. What do you expect from him this year in that Detroit Lions offense? Is it going to be a big struggle season? They're really going to rely on the run this year, and it really depends on how DeAndre Swift's able to handle, handle the workload. But for the Lions, the, the wide receiver room is, is very, very thin. There's no true number one wide receiver. They're going to rely on TJ Hawkinson a lot of this season. So you're going to see great production from him. Maybe a guy like Amon Ross St. Brown steps up, Tyrell Williams, who has been uh, an okay receiver in his career. But, you know, overall depth-wise, they're really going to struggle. And that's why I think Jared Goff, pretty much no matter what, is going to get blamed for this season, whether it's his fault or not. And that's why they're going to go quarterback in this situation. Right. Goff is going to get the short on the stick, in my opinion, as well. Lions fans, you do have something to be excited about, though. Two first-round picks this year. You've got a couple first-round picks in the future as well. Sam Howell, a great pick to start it off here for that franchise. Now moving into three, we've got the Cincinnati Bengals, who drew a lot of heat 
throughout the draft process, uh, especially when they ended up going with wide receiver Jamar Chase and kind of leaving their franchise quarterback, Joe Burrow, unprotected in the pocket, especially after the injury he sustained last year. Austin, it looks like you have a big-time solution for that with offensive tackle Evan Neal from Alabama. I think he's the number one tackle on a lot of boards so far. Why are the Bengals going at the offensive tackle spot? Is this the clear and obvious pick for them? I think that this is the direction they want to go. I think there's some players that could be actually better, have higher ceilings at number three. But this is the biggest need for them for sure, and and they have to address it. Evan Neal is a guy that could be a franchise left tackle for them, no doubt in my mind. He has the athleticism, the strength. uh, He has the ability to really succeed in that pass game, good footwork. And that's what's really impressive about him. But the, the fluid athlete, the strength, it's all the package that you want for that left tackle spot. And he's making that transition to left tackle this year. So we'll see, see how that goes for him. But barring big changes, I, I don't see him really falling outside the top 10. Right. Looking at Cincinnati's long-term window, if they do end up grabbing a guy like Evan Neal in this year's draft, you have to love the direction of that franchise with Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, then Evan Neal possibly. I think that is a wonderful trio to be building around for the future. Moving into pick four now, we have my New York Jets here, Austin. Last year, they made some notable notable moves, moving up for Elijah Vera Tucker in round one. Of course, Zach Wilson, second overall as well. I'm very excited about the direction of our franchise, and I think here you have us going with a player that is widely considered to be the top player in the class. That's Kayvon Thibodeau, the edge out of Oregon. You had kind of talked about some guys with high upside. What does Thibodeau bring at that edge position? And this is a guy I still considered at number three for Cincinnati, despite the huge need to tackle Thibodeau is one of those guys that very well could be the best player in this class, and he ends up falling to four with the New York Jets. The New York Jets have an obvious need at that, that edge spot, and Thibodeau made a big impact in his first game at Oregon, or in the first game of the year at Oregon, and the, the issue was, obviously gets hurt in that game. He forced a fumble, but he is going to be a very, very impactful defender. I think uh, very good athleticism, has a little bit to go in terms of the pass, pass rushing polish, uh, he's going to be a really good run defender as well. So complete package and Thibodeau. He's got a little bit of work to go. However, I think he is a tremendous talent, high upside here. Right. I'm, I'm really happy you actually mentioned the, the difference there in the run pass game for him. When I watch him, he jumps off the screen as a run defender immediately. Uh, I think he's going to be elite in that area, kind of like what we see with Jadeveon Clowney, who was a former first overall pick. And then also, I think the, the pass rush potential is there for him. Uh, the athletic traits, the um, ability to get, um, off the edge as a speed rusher, I really like what I see from him. If he develops his hands a little bit more, I think could be a phenomenal player who I think really, really fits Robert Sala's defense for the long term there in New York. Jumping into five now, we've got your Jacksonville Jaguars. It seems like our two teams can never really get apart from each other in the draft, usually in the top five, honestly, uh, for our franchises, Austin. At five, you have them going with Derek Stingley Jr., who I think is one of the more fun players in this class, honestly. Uh, and he's coming from LSU. What's your thoughts on Stingley? Derek Stingley is an elite man-to-man corner. He has one of the best, one of the best physical packages of players in the draft. Um, in high school, he was in the 97th percentile in terms of athleticism for amongst all NFL players while he was at the high school level. That just speaks to how great of an athlete he is. Tremendous man corner, has a really good eye for the ball, um, great ball skills as well. So overall, this is a guy that could end up being the best player in the draft. In my opinion, he falls all the way to five just because of the quarterback needs. I don't think Rattler or Howell really have a chance to be as good as as Derek Stingley. That might be a hotter take, but I just think Derek Stingley is so polished. Even as a true freshman playing for LSU, made a huge impact. Jacksonville is looking for that that number one kind of corner. They have Griffin, they have C.J. Henderson, and they drafted Tyson Campbell at the first pick in the second round this past year. But I think with Stingley still there, that that really shouldn't you know despite the the okay corner room they're going to have to really upgrade their long term Derek Stingley Stingley Jr. is that for me it's pretty funny here throughout the first mock so far the first five picks we've already seen positional value really come into play uh with the order uh Kayvon Thibodeau and Derek Stingley widely could be regarded as two of the best players in this class we see them fall four and five because of the positional value for a quarterback they tend to just go at the top of the draft nearly every single year unless there's a franchise edge there 
And then also we see a tackle go third because of the serious demand for that position there in Cincinnati. Stingley falling to five for the Jaguars. Like you said, maybe not the biggest position of need, but best player available is not a bad pathway for the Jaguars at this point. Moving into six here, we have the Philadelphia Eagles, and we have another member of, a sec of the secondary, Kyle Hamilton from Notre Dame. Austin, talk about the strength of this class in terms of the secondary and what Kyle Hamilton will also bring to Philadelphia. There's some really nice overall depth and top tier talent in this class in the secondary. Kyle Hamilton is an absolute beast. Got the 6'4 frame. He's rangy, uh, really good in the open field, but he also has really good ball skills on top of it. So uh, kind of a complete package at that safety spot. And the Philadelphia Eagles are looking to rebuild that defense. They're kind of going into rebuild mode right now. And they have some draft picks to really help them out in this draft in particular. Kyle Hamilton could be a phenomenal playmaker at the back end of this uh, Philadelphia Eagles defense. Right. I think he's going to be very, very strong in a lot of areas. You need a safety to be proficient. And the Eagles have badly, badly needed secondary help since the departure of Malcolm Jenkins a few years ago. So I think this is a match made in heaven there. Kyle Hamilton landing with the Eagles at pick six. Moving to seven, we have another bird here, the Dirty Birds, the Atlanta Falcons, now on the clock. And you have them going quarterback Malik Willis out of Liberty University, Austin. Malik Willis, is he going to be a key name to watch throughout this process, jumping the boards? You know, a lot of people on their overall big boards and stuff have him in the later 20s, uh, early 30s. I think that he can ascend into this number seven spot, just considering his athleticism, his quick release. It'll kind of remind you a little bit of Michael Vick just by how he plays and, and how great of an athlete he is. So the Atlanta Falcons are doing very well by getting him at number seven. And I think his name is going to continue to rise as the year goes on. Really helped Liberty uh, get on the map last year in college football, finally having them be ranked, which was incredible to see. And he was a big reason why. Uh, the, the team succeeded overall last year. So Malik Willis is that name to watch. Right. The first week of college football, his first touchdown of the year was a 35-yard strike. Uh, and I think he's someone who's going to ascend throughout this process as well. Uh, no surprise to me that you have him at seven here because I think he could be that type of talent when it comes to the actual draft in April. Pick number eight. Now we have the Las Vegas Raiders who have had a very interesting offseason, honestly. They brought in Yannick Ngakwe. Uh, they've made some real shifts uh, on that offensive line. And to be honest, I don't think that they got better. I think that they've kind of had a so-so offseason uh, where it's kind of led them to a point where I don't know what they're going to be this next year. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how you feel about that, but you have them going into your defensive line to Marvin Leal from Texas A&M. Uh, so can you just talk about the Raiders a little bit to begin with and then also what DeMarvin Leal could bring to that franchise? Yeah, the, the Raiders are kind of rebuilding their trench play, which I, I'm a little perplexed on, especially on the offensive side of the ball. But Getting a guy like DeMarvin Leal is really, really good for them. He provides some versatility. At a and he played inside, he's played outside, and he's really good at getting to, the, getting to the quarterback, has some nice pass rushing moves. I like him as an overall prospect, versatility. There's a lot to love about him. I think he could fit into multiple schemes as well. So DeMarvin Leal at number eight, that's good value as well. Once again, we talked about that positional value thing. De DeMarvin Leal very well could be a top five player in this class just by his physical traits and his versatility. Right. I'm excited to monitor kind of where we see him going throughout this process uh, because I think it's going to be fairly dependent on what teams are picking in the top five if we see him go or not because of that positional need. Uh, but again, like you said, could be a phenomenal grab later. Kind of reminds me of like Leonard Williams when we saw him fall a little bit a few drafts ago. Uh, not necessarily that DeMarvin Leal is going to be Leonard Williams, but just kind of the comparison for how the draft played out that year. Now at pick nine, we have the New York Giants who do have two first round picks in this draft. Uh, and the first one you have them going with offensive lineman Darian Kennard from the University of Kentucky. What does he bring? He is obviously a big dude. Absolutely massive prospect. Uh, a little raw in that regard. However, I think that the New York Giants are going to continue to build that offens offensive line. Dave Gettleman loves size. I think we've seen that in the past with some of his draft selections. I don't see that being any different in this pick at number nine with Kennard. Uh, th this Kentucky product definitely has ascended himself uh, at the very start of this year, and hopefully he can remain here. But, I mean, those physical traits are hard to ignore, and I think that very well could slide him into that top 15. Right. Think about a guy like Mekhi Becton, who going into that year maybe wasn't regarded as a top 10 pick and then really started to fly up boards uh, when he was performing well and then also looking at those physical traits that he tested very well in the combine. Darian Kennard, with those physical traits, could keep him very high in this year's draft as well. 
Jumping into pick 10, we have the Carolina Panthers, who I have a lot of questions about uh, just in terms of their quarterback position. You have them here going with offensive tackle Jackson Kirkland from the University of Washington, Austin. Talk about him a little bit, and then also, does this mean you're a believer in Sam Darnold there in Carolina? Doesn't necessarily mean I'm a believer, but I do think that they're going to need more than one year to really evaluate him. I think they're really going to try to hold on to him, extend him, pretty much no matter how the year goes. The, the nice thing is they're not completely locked in, but I mean, with the draft capital that they get, gave up, they're going to have to be somewhat committed to him. And I think Jackson Kirkland can really help out this offense. Carolina has been so focused on defense. Now they make that focus on the offensive side of the ball. They decided to go all in on defense in Matt Rule's first draft. And, and now I think this team's ready to go. They're, they're ready to you know, work towards starting to com- compete. I think that Sam Darnold's going to have to prove some things, but overall they're going to want to give him all the tools to succeed. And that's really in this draft going to start by building that offensive line and getting a guy like Kirkland. Right. Last offseason, we saw Carolina really make some moves along the offensive line in a budget form. You know, they brought in Pat Elfline. Uh, they drafted Brady Christensen on, I believe, day the back end of day two. Jackson Kirkland here is a big time improvement, a big time commitment to that tackle spot. They already uh, extended Taylor Moten. So they are now finding their offensive tackles and I think really trying to put Sam Darnold in a situation to succeed. I wouldn't be surprised if a few years down the road, we see Carolina starting to run that division uh, because I think that they have a lot of the pieces there, especially if Sam Darnold can really elevate his play. Moving into pick 11, we have the New York Giants here yet again, Austin. You have them go offensive line at nine, and now you have them going on the other side of the trenches, edge Drake Jackson from USC. Why is he the selection here at 11 for New York? The reason is Drake Jackson is an interesting prospect because he is a really good athlete and he's got great length. I think that's, those are the two best qualities about him. A little bit of a lack of polish, I guess you could say, but I think the upside is there. And for the New York Giants, once again, it's kind of size, length. They love drafting these guys that they can kind of mold into their own. So taking two high upside guys for the New York Giants is a way I really think that they could be going. Right. They're really focusing on improving their trench play. And I really love this, actually, because Dave Gettleman has done such a good job throughout free agency, in my opinion, finding guys to address skill positions. You look at bringing in Kenny Galladay as a wide receiver. The last couple of years, he brought in Bradbury, brought in Adoree Jackson, has really improved his cornerback play holistically as well. Logan Ryan, another free agent acquisition a few years ago. Now it's about trying to get into the trenches. Leonard Williams, Drake Jackson could be a really good combination off the edge there in uh, New York. Pick 12 now, we have the Arizona Cardinals, who last year, throughout this whole process, Austin, we were screaming, cornerback, 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 cornerback. They went with a linebacker in Zayvon Collins, who we both thought was a really good player, but really did perplex us with them making that selection. Here, is this pick a cornerback? You have Kair Elam from Florida, a cornerback. Does the Malcolm Butler news have anything to do with this selection, or is it just more of the same old here for Arizona? Arizona's just needed a quarter, cornerback in general, whether Malcolm Butler was there or not, that, that was going to be the pick. Kyrie Elam falls out of the top 10, which, once again, it's possible that he, he is in that top 10 realm. Elite coverage corner. Florida's done a really nice job producing corners the last couple of years. Um, we, we've seen Tease Tabor. We've seen C.J. Henderson. They've done a nice job grooming these guys for the next level. Obviously, Tabor didn't work out, but C.J. Henderson looks like he could be a really nice starting cornerback in this league. Kair Elam for the Cardinals is really going to help the back end of that secondary. You pair him with a guy like Byron Murphy as well. They have Buda Baker. This secondary is looking better and better by the day, and I think it really starts with getting Kair Elam to kind of shore up that secondary. Right. Arizona was kind of relying on Malcolm Butler this year. Then, of course, all the retiree uh, news that has really surfaced as of late kind of puts them in a state of you know question for me. I don't really know how they're going to perform this year because of that issue. They're in a very tough division. I think the Cardinals are a really good team, but I think that they're going to be on the short end of the stick just with how strong that division is, some of the moves that their division rivals had made. But Kyrie Elam will be a massive upgrade for them going into next season. Uh, I really like that for them a lot at 12. Jumping into 13, we have the Washington football team. And by this time next year, they could be Washington something else. So that'll be another fun story to keep up with. What will their team name be? But here, you're more focused on finding the quarterback for them rather than that new team name. That is Desmond Ritter out of the University of Cincinnati. This is a team that has ascended in a lot of different areas. They are going to be a very competent, capable team this season. Why is Desmond Ritter the pick here at 13? He had a phenomenal, phenomenal week one of the college football season. 
And the thing about Cincinnati, they very well could be that dark horse for being a uh, college football playoff team. Now, I think that's a little crazy to say, but they have some really, really good NFL quality talent on their roster as it currently sits. And the, the thing that really surprised me about what they've been able to do is they, do, they never get the top recruits. So for them to do that, them and Iowa State, really nice job building their program. Now, getting back to Ritter himself, he is a dual threat quarterback. Uh, he's, he has really, really good foot speed, and it doesn't look like it when you're watching him, but he's able to run through an entire secondary run right by guys. So we've seen a couple of long touchdowns from him just on his legs alone. Uh, I, I think that having that ability to run in that Washington offense could be very, very dangerous. We've seen that when uh, RG3 was there. Had he not gotten hurt, that could have been a really beautiful marriage for years and years to come. But this will get a little bit of shades of RG3, not as athletic, but still a dual threat quarterback for this team. And this is really exciting. Austin, I'm sure you probably feel this way as well about Washington. This is going to be a really fun team to watch. They defend like no one else in the NFL. They're one of the best defensive teams. Uh, and then you're also looking at a team that has some really fun playmakers. Antonio Gibson, someone who can catch the, a ton of passes. J.D. McKissick catches a ton of balls out of the backfield. Uh, you're looking at Curtis Samuel, who's kind of a dual threat wide receiver. Not very often you hear something like that. Bringing in a dual threat QB like Desmond Ritter could really unlock this team. And I think they're in a, a perfect situation as well this year going into next year because you have a veteran QB who's willing to air it out and make winning plays in Ryan Fitzpatrick this year. They can be competing for the playoffs right now. They have a phenomenal defense like we talked about. And then also, this is the perfect situation for a college quarterback to land in. Desmond Ritter comes in. He's not going to have to do a whole lot in year one for this team to be successful. And then he's also got that high ceiling as well to really maybe elevate Washington into a team that we could be talking about as contenders for quite some time down the road. Uh, I love the way that they built their team, and I think Desmond Ritter would be a phenomenal selection for them at pick 13. Moving into the 14th pick here of the first round, we have the Pittsburgh Steelers, who I think isn't necessarily one of those teams that we don't we know what they'll be a few years from now. I think there's a lot of question marks uh, kind of about which way this franchise is heading. Now, of course, Mike Tomlin does cover a lot of those uh, questions. I know you and I feel very, very strongly about Mike Tomlin as a coach. He's a very, very good coach, and you have them going with the quarterback here, Carson Strong, probably a name not a lot of our viewers have heard of at this point. University of Nevada quarterback. Break down what does Carson Strong bring to uh, Pittsburgh? I think I'm a little he ahead of the curve on here. I think he is going to be a first-round pick. There's some people that don't really even know who this guy is. However, at Nevada, he has proven to be a NFL uh, first-round pick. And the thing about him, he's not a very good athlete by any means, but he's got a rocket arm, a pretty accurate quarterback as well, and he has some interesting upside. So the reason I do this here, Pittsburgh is going to be looking for a Big Ben kind of build, and I think that's what Carson Strong is. I think you know the, the Steelers transition nicely here, looking for a guy with, with a pretty good arm. And they're not really – I don't think they're going to be ready to turn over this offense to a guy like Dwayne Haskins. I have my, my criticisms, criticisms of him. And as well as a guy like Mason Rudolph, I think they're ready to take a quarterback in this draft finally. No pun intended here, but Pittsburgh looking for a strong arm quarterback – Carson Strong is going to be that guy for them in this mock draft. I like this fit a lot. Uh, and I, like you said, Austin, I think you're ahead of the curve. That's one of the key reasons. Uh, you know, you've, you've done this a ton of times where you're ahead of the curve on guys end up being right about, hey, these guys are flying up boards and we get kind of told, hey, we're not ESPN. Uh, but that's all right because ESPN is usually behind the curve a little bit too on some of these things. Uh, moving into pick 15 here, we have the Minnesota Vikings now. Uh, I think that this is a team that could actually be a dark horse team to make the Super Bowl uh, before we jump into the season. They're going to need some things to go right. Uh, obviously, they're going to need to stay healthy, uh, but they've got a lot of talent on this roster at a lot of different positions. Their D-line is going to be so much better this year from where it was last year with Daniil Hunter out, Michael Pierce opting out. They also added in Delvin Tomlinson, brought back Everson Griffin, uh, and also brought back Sheldon Richardson. So they, they've got a lot of talent on that D-line, Austin. And you have them going with the cornerback, Ahmad Gardner from the University of Cincinnati, from my knowledge, he hasn't given up a touchdown uh, in man-to-man -man solo coverage in his two seasons at Cincinnati. Break down what he brings to Minnesota. Elite, elite man-to-man -man corner. Um, definitely can work on, on the zone a little bit, but I, I, I think that his man coverage skills are tremendous. I think he has really fluid hips, good change of direction, and that's what you're looking for in a corner, cornerback at number 15. If you can get an elite man-to-man -man guy, especially like that stat you said, zero touchdowns given up in that man-to-man -man coverage. 
really impressive. Mike Zimmer historically loves to run a lot of blitzes, a lot of man to man, a lot of, Hey, you got to guard your guy. Do not give up anything. Cause you got, you have no help on the back end, a lot of zero blitzes. So a guy that fits in perfectly with that, that scheme is Ahmad Gardner. I think this is a perfect pairing for these two. Right. Mike Zimmer, Rick Spielman have been looking for their number one cornerback in the first round for many years. Look at names like Jeff Gladney, Mike Hughes, Trey Waynes, just to name a few. None of those guys really worked out in Minnesota. I think Ahmad Gardner would be a different story if he landed with the Vikings. Phenomenal grab here at 15 for the Vikings. Pick 16 now we have the Denver Broncos here. They've got a whole quarterback controversy of their own with Teddy Bridgewater, Drew Locke, and you have them actually solving that here, going with an Ole Miss quarterback, Matt Corral, who I think is going to be an, another guy similar to Carson Strong who probably goes up boards that you're kind of a little bit ahead of the curve on. Austin, what does Corral bring to Denver? I, I've seen Matt Corral play live. Very, very impressive. But one of the big throws that I've seen from him, uh, he threw a ball 65 yards in the air and completed it in a game, which is absolutely wild uh, in, in contested coverage as well. Matt Corral's got the, the, arguably the biggest arm in the entire class. Him and Spencer Rattler are right there. But Matt Corral is going to fly up some boards. People might not be as familiar with him, but I think he has the opportunity under Lane Kiffin to have a breakout, breakout season. This could be big for them, and Denver is looking for that big, strong-arm quarterback. We've seen that in the past. They've tried it. They tried to get guys like Paxton Lynch. That didn't work out. Um, I, I, I think that this is a really good pairing for them. And Denver is not going to be content with Teddy Bridgewater or, quite frankly, Drew Locke, another big arm quarterback that they currently have. Denver's got such a nice young core of receivers in Cortland Sutton, Jerry Judy, K.J. Hamler there. They're just missing the quarterback. And imagine Matt Corral airing out some deep balls in that Denver air. He could probably throw it even a little bit further once he gets into that higher altitude. This is an extremely fun pick right around the middle of the first round as we move into the back end of the, sec uh, of the first round here, rather. Make sure to hit that like button on today's video if you're enjoying the content so far. Subscribe if you are new to Utility Sports. It'd mean a lot to us to have you guys be a part of the gang here. We do a lot of live streams, a lot of other stuff that you'll want to be a part of as well here on the channel, including an upcoming jersey giveaway. So make sure you are subscribed to not miss out on that. 17, now you have the Chargers here going with Edge, George Karlaftis from the University of Purdue. What does he bring to the table? And is this kind of a, oh, we lost Melvin Ingram. We have to figure out what to do across from Joey Bosa. And that's something that they've had question marks on. And, and I was a little concerned about that going into this season. George Karloftis is a bigger, powerful edge. He's going to do a really good job defending the run. He's a competent pass rusher as well. And the Chargers definitely need a guy that can defend the run opposite of Joey Bosa. I think they've done a nice job building that offense, but now it's, it's time to redirect their focus to that edge spot. And I think Karloftis is the, a great fit with this uh, Chargers defense for sure. Yeah, the Chargers have had a little bit of a rotation uh, there with Tom Telesco looking for help at the nose tackle spot and also that opposite edge from Joey Bosa. George Karlaftis can really help a lot in Brandon Staley's defense, addressing both of those needs there, honestly. Uh, someone who's going to help in the run game and also be a quality pass rusher uh, across from Bosa at that edge position. Moving into 18, we have the New England Patriots who've been so busy in the last few months. Of course, made a ton of moves in free agency. Then the surprise release of Cam Newton, really putting the organization in the hands of Mac Jones, Austin. You have them going here, wide receiver Chris Olave. I think wide receiver one is their clear and obvious need. Uh, and I think Olave could really help Mac Jones early in his career. What does Chris Olave do well as a wide receiver? Chris Olave can take the top off the defense. Now, he's not the most dynamic athlete, but he's just a phenomenal route runner. He plays the game the right way. We saw against the University of Minnesota, he made a big impact on that game, big imprint, and shows that he could be the number one wide receiver in this class, depending on you know how things go. Obviously, C.J. Stroud, the, the number one starter for them, freshman guy. Coming in there, it, it's going to take a little bit of time to kind of mesh. I, I think we saw some of the inconsistency uh, in, his, in his game, but they nevertheless, they came out with the victory. Chris Olave is going to be a big impact player for that o Ohio State offense. But there's also another receiver that we might see a little later on that could steal some of that thunder. Right. Olave, his production might not mirror what it was last year. Uh, we were a little surprised when he didn't declare for the draft, when he actually went back to the uh, Ohio State. We were both surprised by that. He was probably going to be a first-round pick last year. We see him go 18th overall. Possible he could slide up a little bit. Maybe possible he could slide down a little bit. It's going to all depend on C.J. Stroud's development as the starting quarterback there. And at 19, now we have the New Orleans Saints here, Austin. 
and you have another Ohio State wide receiver following him up, that's Garrett Wilson. Is this the guy that could be stealing some of that production away from Chris Olave? Exactly what I was talking about. I, I'm a little worried now you got a guy like uh, Garrett Wilson coming in, a first-round caliber wide receiver. The New Orleans Saints are going to likely take him. I'm not sure that they're ready to give up on Jameis Winston after this season. Obviously, they have no commitment to him, but I think he's going to play well enough to play into another contract with this team. Therefore, you have to get him some more weapons. You'll have Michael Thomas, but you also need a true number two wide receiver. Garrett Wilson can be that for them. Obviously, Michael Thomas came from Ohio State. They're comfortable from drafting there. And Garrett Wilson could be the next uh, Ohio State receiver to go there. Another guy that we've seen from Ohio State there, Marshawn Lattimore. So keep, keep in mind there, they have a little bit of a history of drafting these Ohio State guys. Yeah, New Orleans definitely does take a close look at Ohio State. And I think Garrett Wilson's a phenomenal grab here. And also one other thing, when there's smoke, there's usually fire. There's been a lot of drama around Michael Thomas. I know the expectation right now is that he stays with the Saints for quite some time. But you never really know, especially when it comes to the wide receiver position. Some of these guys like to force their way out of situations. I'm not saying that there's anything definitive yet on Michael Thomas, but I wouldn't be surprised if we had into next season with Michael Thomas on one of the 31 other teams in the NFL. That would not be shocking to me at this point. So I think wide receiver is definitely a key point of need for the New Orleans Saints. Pick 20 now, we have the Philadelphia Eagles here. Uh, remember, they went Kyle Hamilton sixth overall in this mock draft. And here you have him coming back addressing the quarterback position with Keaton Slovis. I think there's a pretty big divide uh, amongst people when they're talking about Keaton Slovis. Austin, why do you have him going at 20 here? Now, for the Philadelphia Eagles, I do want to preface this before this pick's made. I'm not exactly sure how they feel about Jalen Hurts, but it doesn't show me the most confidence that they go and trade for Gardner Minshew. I think there's a possibility that Minshew starts at some point this season because there's going to be some ups and downs with Jalen Hurts and whether or not they're going to be able to weather the storm. They're not a patient organization by any stretch of the imagination. So it's very possible that he gets benched. And then that really kind of opens the door for, you know, them going in and next year saying we need a quarterback. Keaton Slovis is an accurate quarterback, not a guy that's going to really, really wow you with his arm talent. However, uh, pinpoint accuracy, a guy that can really command an offense, good leader. And that's kind of what Philadelphia needs. Right. Philadelphia here having a guaranteed two first round picks this year, uh, going quarterback at one of them kind of gives you a little bit of flexibility to still improve your roster in other areas. Keaton Slovis could be a, a real sticking point for them in the draft. I feel moving into 21, we have the Dallas Cowboys here uh, and you have them going with safety, Brandon Joseph from the university of Northwestern. What does Brandon Joseph really provide to a Cowboys defense that I think both of us would agree on that they need a lot of help still in that secondary moving forward. They've made that a primary, primary focus for them is that secondary. That's really important to them. Obviously, they've been trying to rebuild that. But the interesting thing was last year, they had a focus on linebacker. Jabril Cox, Micah Parsons being uh, kind of that next generation of the linebacker spot. I think that's more for money reasons. They're going to be parting ways. There's going to be some moving pieces on this defense. There's no clear, clear answer at that safety spot. So Brandon Joseph, a uh, really solid player from Northwestern, a guy that can cover some ground. Also, uh, a pretty sure guy in, in tackling. So the Dallas Cowboys are definitely looking to improve that secondary, and I think they do that through Brandon Joseph. Right. The Cowboys this year tried patching up that secondary, made a couple one-year signings, I believe Keanu Neal, Malik Hooker, uh, two of those guys, but we don't really believe those are going to be long-term sticking points. I mean, there's a reason they're on short one-year deals uh, with very low money uh, involved in those deals just because – um, some injury concerns for especially Keanu Neal and Malik Hooker. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing here. The Cowboys looking for a fresh start here with Brandon Joseph. Jumping into 22, the New York Jets on the clock again. This pick comes from the Seattle Seahawks in the Jamal Adams trade, which feels like so long ago. Now at this point, Austin, you have them going with a cornerback out of the University of Washington named Trent McDuffie. What does he bring to the position that the New York Jets are going to fall in love with? You know, not the biggest size, but he is a he is a physical corner. I think the New York Jets need a little little more nastiness in that secondary. And obviously, corner is still a huge need for this team. I'm not exactly sure why Robert Sala and, and Joe Douglas didn't try to address that a little harder during the offseason. However, I think they're going to realize that after this season, uh, you know, another non-playoff year likely for them in their future. But I think, you know, the ability to have the 22nd pick from that Jamal Adams deal definitely helps. Trent McDuffie is going to help out the secondary big time moving forward. Right. I really hope the Jets look to improve that cornerback position. I wanted that last year. We didn't touch it at all, basically, just assuming that Blesson Austin, Bryce Hall are going to be the two guys that we need them to be. 
Uh, I don't necessarily believe in those two as much as I know some other New York Jets fans do. So hopefully Trent McDuffie does end up coming onto the New York Jets and working out for us as our number one corner of the future. Pick 23, now we have the Indianapolis Colts. And this is a really interesting pick to monitor here because this pick could very easily end up being the Philadelphia Eagles pick. Carson Wentz has to play 75% of the snaps for this team offensively in order for this pick to be compensated to the Eagles from that trade. Otherwise, I believe it's just a second round pick. Uh, so there's a lot on the line this year for the Colts in terms of the play time uh, of their starting quarterback, Carson Wentz. But here at this point with him out, we have them still with the pick at 23, going with offensive tackle Zion Nelson. Uh, the Colts have had a strong offensive line for years, but now there's a, a couple weak links on that offensive line. What could Zion Nelson help them do, Austin? He's going to be nice in, the, in terms of pass protection, and I think that's what they're really going to be focused on. Carson Wentz, you got to keep him upright. Uh, definitely has some injury concerns. So getting a guy like Zion Nelson is going to help. Indianapolis historically loves to take offensive linemen. And I think Zion Nelson adds a little bit of nastiness to that O-line, something that they've been kind of needing. Right. I think that this is a big-time improvement to an already strong positional grouping for the Indianapolis Colts. We know they want to play defense, run the football, uh, and then pass when they have to. And I think Zion Nelson helps protect Carson Wentz and also helps them a lot in the run game as a mauler. 24, we have the Tennessee Titans again staying in the AFC South here. And we have them going with tight end Jalen Weidermeyer from the Texas uh, A&M Aggies. Austin, does this pick come as a direct result of losing Johnny Smith this last offseason? 100%. And the Tennessee Titans love to utilize that tight end position. And they're really going to miss Johnny Smith's presence. He was a de developmental tight end, a guy that people really didn't believe in truly. But he ascended in terms of um, his overall production went up, up, up. And then that ultimately drove the price tag up on them when they were trying to re-sign him in free agency. Obviously takes off to New England. Weidermeyer could slot in nicely. Good athletic tight end. I think that he's going to have a really nice season at a and Right. The importance of the play action there in Tennessee. I think Weidermeyer is a perfect tight end fifth uh, for that system. And I think he's going to be uh, very productive if he does land in Tennessee. We'll see exactly how their offense shifts and molds in the first year without Arthur Smith, though, as he's now the Atlanta Falcons head coach. 25, we have the Cleveland Browns, who I expect to have a really great season. Their defense is loaded. Their offense is very, very nice as well. We'll see how Odell Beckham Jr. does coming back from injury. We'll see how Baker Mayfield performs with him on the field. But at this point, you have them going with an edge from Michigan, Austin, Aiden Hutchinson. Uh, it's very common to see Michigan edges this high in the draft. What does Aiden Hutchinson bring? He can really control the line of scrimmage, does a great job containing, forcing things back inside. Also, very, very good against the run as a whole. Um, he's going to get better and better as a pass rusher as well. But for the Cleveland Browns, this is a result of Jadavion only being on a one-year deal. And we've talked over and over and over again about Cleveland needing to get a guy opposite of Miles Garrett. And they finally get it here at 25 with Aiden Hutchinson. Right. The Browns have done such a good job in recent drafts. Uh, they've improved in every area of football. Jeremiah wusu koromo was an absolute steal in the second round last year. Now Aiden Hutchinson, a, a very nice piece that complements the rest of this team very, very well. I think he's a nice grab here at 25 for Cleveland. Moving into 26, we have the Miami Dolphins, who had a little bit of su some surprise moves I think could very well be considered one of the front runners to land Deshaun Watson in a trade. Uh, but at this point, you have them going with an edge from Cincinnati, Myjay Sanders, Austin. Three Cincinnati Bearcats we've seen go off the board so far. What could Sanders help them do? Does he complement Jalen Phillips long-term? He's some pass rushing upside, and I love him and Jalen Phillips, that this team's just getting more athletic in general. And the Miami Dolphins are starting to build something hopefully special. And it all, a lot of it hinges on that quarterback position. But Myjay Sanders is going to get in front of a lot of people's eyes. Obviously, Cincinnati is not a team that you see a lot on a week-to-week -week basis. But with them potentially in the college football playoff conversation all year long, you're going to get to see this guy's ability um, on, on Saturday. So hopefully they get some more national TV games, just considering that they have a strong roster and they're going to be very, very competitive. And you already see it with three potential first round picks in this mock. Right. I think my Jay Sanders here is another guy that you're probably a little bit ahead of the curve on. Honestly, I haven't heard his name a ton. Probably some viewers that don't know who my Jay Sanders was before clicking onto this video. That's one of the key reasons you need to be here. These are guys that we're going to start seeing ascend later in the draft process, and Austin's ahead of it right now. Uh, and, of course, he's going to be mocking, tweaking things as the college football season goes on to keep up the most up-to-date information for these drafts uh, every single Monday. Moving into 27, we have the Baltimore Ravens last year. They grabbed Rashad Bateman and Tylen Wallace with two of their first three picks. 
completely revamped the wide receiver room, but you don't think they're quite done there. You have them going with John Mechie the third from the University of Alabama. Why is Mechie the pick here? Mechie is great value at this point. Considering he's all the way here at 27, I think he's going to continue to ascend on draft boards. Considering how good this Alabama offense is, He could be the focal point at receiver, and I think he's going to reap the most benefits of having this top-tier, talented quarterback in Bryce Young for this team. And I think he's going to catch a ton of touchdown passes. He's going to be a big-time playmaker for this offense, and that's going to be the main reason why he ascends to that number one wideout spot. And he is all the way here at 27, and Baltimore is not afraid to grab another weapon for Lamar. And kind of looking at what he has to work with, you know, J.K. Dobbins has hurt. So maybe they're going to open it up and throw it a little more this year. Really use this as a year to develop Lamar Jackson as a passer, therefore making this more valuable the following year as they might have to tweak their offense a little bit more. Baltimore always gets the most of their defensive players. They also added Odafe away last year in the draft. Now coming back, grabbing a third wide receiver who I think is going to be a really high quality player. Baltimore becomes even scarier than they already are. Pick 28, we have the Green Bay Packers here now. Of course, this is the big pivot year. Aaron Rodgers' final season in Green Bay. Austin, you have them going in a way that's going to help Jordan Love for the future. Wide receiver Traylon Burks from Arkansas. How important is it for Green Bay and GM Brian Gutekunst to address the wide receiver position very early on in order to help out his young quarterback from Utah State, Jordan Love? They go ahead and get Amari Rodgers last year, but I think bringing a guy like Trey Uh, Traylon Burks is going to be huge because not only do we not know the future with Aaron Rodgers, Devontae Adams' future is very much in question. And you cannot roll into that following year without Devontae Adams and Aaron Rodgers. They're going to have some picks to be able to replace those two potentially. Traylon Burks, 6'3 frame, good red zone target as well. That's what Jordan Love's definitely going to need in his first year as a full-time starting quarterback. Yeah, I like that you have Amari Rodgers, who's a little bit smaller, compact guy, going to make people miss. Traylon Burks, give him a bigger target. And you need to start building out those weapons for your new young quarterback. And I think this is a really good direction for the Green Bay Packers in what is you know, a pretty tough situation to be losing a guy at the end of the season like Aaron Rodgers, who's so, so good. Uh, we know what he is, a former NFL MVP multi- multiple times even. Uh, so it's you know hard to say the grass is greener on the other side. Uh, but they're going to try their best to improve the football team for Jordan Love. Pick 29, we have the Buffalo Bills here now. Josh Allen has emerged as a superstar, and that's really why we see them this late in the mock draft area. And you have them going with a center, Tyler Linderbaum, from the University of Iowa. What could he bring to Buffalo? He's an extremely polished run blocker, gets to that second level, great reach block ability. And I think he might be the most consistent offensive lineman in this entire class. I don't, think, I don't think he necessarily has the most upside, but you know that this guy could be a 12-year starter in this league, super consistent for Iowa. They produce a lot of offensive linemen that are super consistent. We've seen a number of them, like Tristan Wirfs, come through, come through the pipeline there, and you just know you're getting a very solid prospect, well-coached at Iowa, and I think that this is huge for the Buffalo Bills to keep improving that offensive line and really protecting Josh Allen for the long term. The Hawkeyes have produced so many good offensive linemen in the NFL, one of the most recent being Tristan Wirfs for the champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Now Tyler Linderbaum comes in. I think he's going to really help balance out this offense a little bit. Brian Dable, the offensive coordinator there, is almost afraid of running the football a a little bit. Extreme pass-heavy style offense. And I think bringing in someone who can help on the inside of that offensive line as a run blocker could maybe help balance their offensive looks just a little bit more uh, and make Josh Allen even more efficient as a passer. Pick 30, now we have the Detroit Lions here on the clock. This pick comes from the Los Angeles Rams from the Matt Stafford, Jared Goff flip. And here at this point, you have them going wide receiver to help their brand new quarterback, Sam Howell. George Pickens from the University of Georgia. What could he provide to this offense? Humongous red zone threat. One of the most underrated wide receivers in the entire nation. Reason he's this low, ACL tears really you know, we have a lot of question marks on that. How, how is he going to return to form? How is he going to look? That's why George Pickens is here at 30 still. Had he not gotten hurt, very likely a top 20 pick. He's that kind of talent. Detroit gets an awesome value pick here due to injury. And I think he's, he's primed for a very nice career still. That, that's awesome to see here that Detroit not only is going to get a, uh, a quarterback to be their franchise guy, but then also – trying to find him immediate help at the wide receiver position. George Pickens coming in at 30. Very good grab for Detroit. 
31 now we have the reigning champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers and we have them going with offensive tackle Kenyon Green he's a big dude Austin I know I know you like Kenyon Green quite a bit talk about his physical profile where you could see him going throughout this process uh, and really what he would help Tampa Bay with as an offensive tackle this is another guy that maybe is a little undervalued in this mock draft. I very well could see with his physical traits and athleticism moving up into that top 20 realm. I think he's very close to that. There's a couple of things I'd like to see from a technique standpoint, but overall the physical tools are all there. He's, he's primed for a humongous year and we could see a great ascension from him. And the reason Tampa Bay does this, you can play him at tackle. I think maybe he's more, maybe more suited for guard in this offense i'm not entirely sure but with that athleticism he gives you a lot of flexibility on how you can use them right we see big guys on the offensive line get valued very highly throughout the draft process Kenyon green going to be the latest example of that throughout this process and now the final pick here of the first round again if you guys have enjoyed today's video smash that like button and lets us know we're doing a good job here at utility sports and Austin, we have the Kansas City Chiefs here who just remade their whole offensive line, have incredibly improved despite being in the Super Bowl back-to-back -back seasons. And you have them going safety, Jordan Battle from the University of Alabama. Talk about his strengths and what he'll bring to Kansas City. He's really good in the open field at making tackles. One of the better tacklers at that safety spot in this year's draft. Also, good athleticism too. So a lot to like about him. Kansas City is looking to get a little more athletic back there, looking for that sure tackler as well. I thought about wide receiver here, but I also think that they do need a little bit of help in that secondary, especially once they get into that postseason. I think Jordan Battle is a really nice fit for this team. Jordan Battle, a phenomenal addition to an already stacked team in the Kansas City Chiefs. I'm excited to see how this year of the NFL season goes. Again, this is a series, guys. These picks are going to change a little bit throughout the course of the year. Uh, teams are going to shake up position, obviously. We don't have the exact order correct in this one. So, you guys are going to have to be subscribed to keep up with all the latest renditions of our mock draft. Austin does such a good job catching all of the college football games he possibly can, spending a lot of time watching film outside of the college football games, and then, of course, addressing needs for teams as well. I think that, uh, Austin, for the first one here of this series, you did a very good job. You already know a ton about these guys, so it's really impressive to me every time. Uh, and I'm excited to go about this process. Again, if you guys enjoyed, hit that like button, subscribe if you are new to Utility Sports, and we'll catch you guys in the very next Utility Sports video.